Okay, so hi. If anyone doesn't know me, I'm Elizabeth Wiedeker. I'm 22 um, in my final year at Imperial College studying microbiology. Um, I've done all my exams now, actually, so I'm just doing my final project, and I'll talk about that as well later in my presentation. But um, I'll just tell you how I got into microbiology because I don't think it's on the syllabus in A2 or AS or MGCSC, if I'm correct. Well, I never learned about it. So I watched a BBC documentary called Horizon. Has anyone heard of Horizon? Yeah. yeah. So they do a lot of science documentaries, and I stumbled upon it. And there's one that says, why do viruses kill? And that was the name of the documentary. And it was just, to me, it was so interesting. And that actually got me into viruses, really. It was just that one documentary. Um, it's quite funny, because I rewatch it every year, kind of, since A-levels. And I rewatched it recently, and I heard a woman's voice kept narrating, and I recognized it. And then when she came on, I saw it was one of my lecturers, actually, one of my last modules at Imperial. So it's almost like a circle, because I watched that documentary to get into it, and then one of my lecturers was actually in it the whole time. So that was interesting. But yeah, um, I just want to ask, what do you guys think when you hear microbes or microorganisms? Yes. Yes, OK, I thought so. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Really small. Yeah, well, they're all correct, I guess. Some people think germs. Originally, they were called germs, actually. But so they're just organisms that are normally one cell, so they're really small. We're multicellular, we have like uh, skin cells, hair cells, loads of cells, but they're normally just one particle. So I'm going to talk about three types. Can anyone identify them or guess what they could be? It's not like species or anything, just types of microbes. Which one? Red blood cell. Yeah, that's a red blood cell. <laughs> so this is in the bloodstream. But I mean, Johnson said one earlier. What did you say? Bacteria. Yeah, so bacteria is the first one. Can anyone guess the second one? Five. Yes. Third one? To my friends, I talk about this a lot. <laughs> this one. Yes, parasite. OK. Um, I don't expect anyone to know, but can anyone tell me the difference between them? I don't know if we've learned this. Yeah, so there's a big dispute over whether it's alive or not. But on a simpler level, maybe that's um, concerning a nucleus. Does anyone know which one does and doesn't have a nucleus? Because we have a nucleus in all of our cells. Does it have or doesn't have one? Right, so a virus doesn't have one. One other one doesn't have one as well. Which one is it? Yes. So bacteria, and then a parasite does. So bacteria doesn't have a nucleus, which means they can't be as complicated or as complex as us, because we have nucleuses, nuclei. Um, so there's different types of strategies which bacteria can live in. So they're free living, for example, they'll be found in the environment, in the ocean, or they can live in organisms like ourselves. So mutualistic means they benefit and we benefit. Like in our gut, we have bacteria that help us, and then they get food and place to live. Commensal means they benefit, but we don't. So I read, actually, that the ones on our tongue benefit because they can get food, but they don't give us any benefit. And pathogenic just means they cause disease. So viruses also don't have a nucleus, but they need to be in a cell, so they can't live by themselves. And they're very small. You need an electron microscope to see them. And yeah, there's a dispute over whether they're alive or not. People don't really. And parasites have a nucleus, and parasitic means they live at the expense of a host organism. But apart from that, parasites are very varied. So there's no general. But who thought of worms when I said parasite? Does anyone think of? Yeah, OK. I'm not talking about worms today because they're not microorganisms, because they're bigger. But yeah. So the interesting thing is, actually, the most common related out of humans and all of those three are us and parasites. Who finds that surprising? You guys think, what? It's surprising, isn't it? I mean, look, they look so much more similar than us and a parasite. But yeah, it's because we have a nucleus, basically. So that's the parasite, and that's us. But then bacteria are way down, and viruses aren't even on the tree of life, really. Yeah. Anyway. So can anyone give me an example of any that you might have heard of or might have catched yourself? Yeah, which one is it? Flu? Yes. Yeah, which one is it? Yes, E. coli, influenza. Yes, bacteria. 
Yeah. A virus. A bi virus. <laughs> I'm like, I think that's a prion. Oh, so that's a different, yeah, there's a lot of things, but I'm just talking about these three. Well done, you guys know some. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about a story that I've learned in school about myself, each one that I find interesting. So first, does anyone know what a microbiota is? Have you heard of this word before? Okay, so it's basically the bacteria in our body, so they help us a lot. So predominantly on the skin and in our guts, everyone's heard about these, I'm sure, from Actimel adverts and stuff, so that's actually really important. So they're found in our stomach, our small intestine and large intestine. Can anyone guess where the most are found out of these three? If you think about the conditions of a stomach and intestines, maybe. Which one's the most acidic? Yeah, and they can't live, I mean, some can live in acidic conditions, but it's harsh on them as well. So most live in the large intestines and they digest our food, but they also protect us so they can kind of compete and fight with bad bacteria in our gut, and then they can kind of get rid of them, so they actually help us against illness. And they also help our immune system. Is everyone clear what the immune system does, how it works? So basically it fights disease. So yeah, it really helps in that. So it's important to look after your gut, basically. Okay, so another question. You can guess, don't worry, I don't expect you to be right, but um, comparing human cells to bacteria cells, how many bacteria cells do we have compared to humans? So if we have one human cell, how many bacterial cells do you have? More or less? More? Oh, what did you think? More bacterial human? Which one? Oh, okay, yeah. Ten times more bacterial cells actually than human cells in our body. So if we were to lose all the bacteria, we'd lose two kilograms of weight, actually, which is really weird because they're so small, but it shows that actually a big part of our body. But I don't recommend you lose weight this way because you'll die, so don't do it. <laughs> So yeah, how does this help with disease? So there's a bacteria that's found in our gut normally, and it doesn't cause disease because other good bacteria are fighting it and keeping it in control. But some antibiotics which kill disease can kill the good ones, so the bad one can get strong. Um, but it's really difficult to treat it. But they found a way. Can anyone guess from this emoji what way they found to treat the illness? Yes, feces. So fecal transplantation, you transport the feces from a healthy person. It has loads of good bacteria in it. So if you put it in, a, in the ill person, they actually get the good bacteria and then they get better. And it's worked. They use a tube that goes through the nose actually down the throat. Yeah. Um, it hasn't, but it's not really going, you'd think if it works, why is the medical industry not taking it? Does anyone know why? Number one, because, oh no, no actually like reaction. What's your reaction if they're like, we're gonna put someone's feces down your throat? Yeah, people don't want it because they think it's gross, right? Number two, you can actually have bad bacteria or viruses in it. Just because someone's healthy doesn't mean they don't have bad stuff in there. It's really hard to like, screen viruses, so a lot of hospitals are like, no. Um, and thirdly, um, from a law viewpoint, you can't have right, like, rights or ownership over feces. You can't. Some other scientists just took some bacteria from the feces and made their own mixture by culturing it. And they thought of the name repopulating the gut, so credits to them, it wasn't me. But it's such a good title. Seriously, when papers have good titles, it's so much more interesting. Um, there was one that was, um, I think I sent it to John's song. It's like talking about DNA, rings of DNA that are interlocked, and they called it the Fellowship of the Rings. And I was like, I have to read it now. So if you're ever a scientist, please relate everything to Lord of the Rings, because that's what I'll do. But yeah. So viruses. Does anyone know what a zoonosis is? What does zoo mean in Greek? Yeah, animal. And I don't actually know what gnosis means, so never mind. But yeah, disease that's transmitted from animals or humans, vice versa. Um, does anyone, if you think, does anyone know? Yes, influenza. Another one, I don't, this one, I don't know if you'll get, um, last su summer in South Korea, this was a big problem actually. Does anyone remember? Yeah, yeah, SARS and MERS. So yeah, actually they're originally from bats, but we don't really have much contact with bats, so then they went into civet cats, which are these. I've never seen one before. And that's with SARS, and apparently in some provinces in China, they eat these, so they farm them, put them in cages in live markets, and a man had contact with them. I don't even know if he bought one, but he, it's respiratory, so he must have contacted the virus, and then he went to a hotel, and he pressed the number 10 button for his floor, and just that button then spread it to loads of people in the hotel. So epidemiologists managed to find the exact point of like spreading, which I find really interesting. So yeah, the 10th floor apparently of that hotel. I don't know if anyone will ever go there again now, but I think that was in Hong Kong, so yeah. Um, but MERS is from camels because MERS is Middle Eastern, respiratory syndrome, yeah. 
Um, this is where I learned a lot of stuff. I don't know if you're interested, it's going to spill over. But that's where I learned about zoonosis because I find them really interesting. Um, but yeah, often there's no symptoms in the animals, actually. This is why with flus, people are like, why can't you predict where the new flu is coming from? Well, the pigs and chickens aren't coughing themselves because the virus is co-adapted with them. And then when they come into us, they don't recognize human cells. That it's like different, and so they can end up killing us or being quite extreme in the disease. So we can't yeah, predict new diseases. And they can't be eradicated. So has, there, has everyone heard of smallpox? Yep, so it was the first disease, infectious disease, to be eradicated because it's only in humans. So obviously, if they're in animals, we can't eradicate them because we have to kill the animals within. It's impossible, basically. So yeah. So HIV is actually a zoonosis. I don't know if anyone remembers. Does anyone know where it comes from originally? Which animal? Which one? The most commonly related to us? Yes, chimpanzee. So this is one hypothesis of how it came, but I put question marks in science. You can never really state something as fact. It's quite difficult. So I, I think this makes sense. But basically, transport yourselves back to Cameroon. That's where you think it originated, like early 1900s, quite a while ago. So there's a hunter. I, do you use a machete to like, hunt animals? I'm not sure. Is it a machete? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I didn't know. I just searched a knife. Um, okay. So he's hunting in the forest. He needs to find food for his family. He sees a chimpanzee in the tree, and he thinks, okay, that's a good target. Enough meat on there, hopefully. But then they're strong. They can fight back, right? They can scratch. They can bite. So the hunter ends up getting a wound. So I just put it on the hand here. Sorry if you can't see on this side. Um, and then, so let's say the hunter won, and he's carrying the carcass of a chimpanzee, but then blood can, like transfer between them. And if a chimp is infected with the simians, so that's just the ape or monkey form of HIV, maybe you know deficiency virus, and CPZ is for chimpanzee. If it's infected, it can then go into the hunter and then adapt. And because, does anyone know the percentage similarity of the chimpanzee and humans? 99. Yeah, 99. Yeah, so it's quite high, so it's more likely to be able to adapt. And HIV mutates quite fast, so but yeah. That's just interesting, that's one of the hypotheses, but yeah. So parasites, okay. As I said earlier, viruses are how I got into it, but I actually find parasites now the most interesting because they're just so variant. So this one's called Toxoplasma gondii. Has anyone heard of this one? Yeah, it's not, it's normally, it doesn't cause like much disease in humans, so it's not talked about that much, but basically it normally affects cats and rodents. And, but it needs to be in a cat. So cats are definite, it needs to be in there to complete its cycle. So what it does, it makes the rodents attracted to cat urine. So obviously, normally you see a rat, it's not going to want to go towards a cat because then it'll be eaten. But it can like, interfere with the brain and make the rodent want to go towards a cat and then the rodent's eaten, right? So this can also, humans can also get this um, disease because it's in the cat feces and if a cow, for example, eats it, then we eat a cow, we get it. 90% um, of French people are actually infected with this. Can anyone guess why French, I didn't really know this, but maybe culturally why French people are more likely? Yeah? Yes, raw. They like raw beef. Who here likes, be honest, who here eats raw beef or like medium rare? So get child. <laughs> no, um, but yeah. I don't know how they found this fact out, but maybe they tested it. I don't know. Anyway, so another, t they wanted to see if it has the same effect on humans as rats, right? So apparently infected male students, I don't know why they choose males, but male students, showed a higher attraction to cat urine than their non-infected friends. <laughs> I don't know how they tested this either. But if, you're, if you eat a lot of raw beef, maybe check with someone who's vegan or something to see if you're more attracted to cat urine. But the question is why? Why would this parasite want to make us more attracted to cats? We're not eaten by cats, right? The rats are, but we're not. Um, one scientist said is they can't tell the difference between a rat and a human brain. So they'll just infect us and be like, okay, cause, you know, cause us to be attracted to cat urine. But one scientist said, which I find really interesting, is that if you look at our ancestors, they may have been hunted actually by large cats. So these parasites are much older than us because they're unicellular, and so actually that might be the connection, which I find really interesting because I would never have thought about it, but yeah. So basically it can cause problems in the brain, but it's hard to find direct connections. So yeah, a lot of psychiatric patients apparently are infected. So it's interesting, but anyway. Um, so going on to my project, I also do parasites. I do malaria, as was mentioned before. Um, the, the parasite's called plasmodium. It's transmitted by female Anopheles mosquitoes. Does anyone know why it's only females that transmits malaria? Hmm? No, they, it's through the biting. Yep. Is it only females? Yes, they only feed on blood, basically. Males, don't, males won't even be attracted to you. 
they won't feed on blood, they only feed on sugar. So why do females feed on blood? Think, what's the difference between a male and a female? What does a female need to do? Yeah, make, yeah, fertilize, right? So they actually need to drink blood to fertilize eggs. So yeah. So, and the plasmodium fertilizes itself in the midgut of a mosquito. This is what a mosquito. So when it drinks blood, the parasite goes in the midgut, it makes an egg, and then it goes back into the salivary glands. So when the mosquito bites us again, it goes in with the saliva. And the mosquito, does anyone know why mosquitoes um, kind of produce saliva when they bite us? Yeah, I think it's to prevent clotting. I don't know, I've, that's what I read. And actually, that's, what, that's why you get a bump and it's really itchy, because the body recognizes the saliva and it's like, okay, and it causes an immune reaction. But yeah, so with the saliva, it goes back into our bodies. So I study the stuff in here, how it interacts with the mosquito immune system. So I just made this. Um, so mosquitoes don't cause disease. So I know some people, who here likes mosquitoes? No one likes them, right? Yeah. But they don't actually cause it, they're just carrying it. Um, but they have their own immune system that wants to get rid of the parasite because it's not supposed to be in there. So I'm trying to see if a certain protein that this is an exact image of that the parasite makes inside, if it interferes with the mosquito immune system. So that's what I'm studying. Um, I'll show you some pictures of where I work at Imperial. So most people, when I say insectary, that's literally what it's called. Think there's insects flying around my head all the time or something. Obviously not. <laughs> it just looks like this, actually. Um, so these are just, they've got water inside. That's where the larvae are, because mosquitoes lay their eggs in water. Then you transfer the pupae into this. These are loads of mosquitoes, as you can see. And then they hatch and they fly. And this is like a cloth. So the first time I did it, when you extract it, you kind of use a suction machine, and I, like, I didn't put gloves on, so I got loads of bites over my... You can't feel it. You get used to it after a while, but anyway. And then I take them out, and I put them on this. This produces carbon dioxide. It makes them drowsy, so they can't fly at me, basically. But they're still alive. They just can't move. Or well, they, they twitch a bit, but they can't fly. Um, at this stage, I separate male and female, because we don't care about males when we're studying malaria. And they actually look quite different. This is under a microscope. Can you, sorry, can you see? So the female has this sharp thing to, what's it for? Why would it need the sharp? Yes, the skin, yeah? But a male one will turn like into a Y, and it's more feathered, so they look quite different, but yeah. That's what I look at every day, it's beautiful. <laughs> They're not, I haven't learned to appreciate them that much, but anyway, um, yeah, that's what I do. Um, I'm talking about something different now, more personal, related to science, science and religion. So I believe in God, and my faith is actually quite important to me. It's a big part of my life, and my relationship with God made a lot of my character. But I really struggle to connect my studies and my faith. I just, I heard from a lot of people how they connected it. And I understand, like, there's logic in the universe, but I couldn't, I just couldn't connect it. It was always like I had one view and another view, and I couldn't, like, merge them. But just last week, I heard a lecture, actually, on science and religion by someone who works, I guess, in the religious field, but is actually quite scientific. And it made me realize a lot, and I just thought I'd share what I think. So if somebody asked me, um, how can you believe in science and God? I'd say I think God is logical. I think, I mean, I believe he created the universe, and I think that's the most scientific thing you can do, right? So I think in the natural world, the universe, there's laws, and that he also obeys these laws. And if you look at nature and how things work, you see there is an order, it's not just chaos. So for example, in biology, um, in a population of predator and prey, in an undisturbed, I mean, humans disturb a lot of nature, but in an undisturbed habitat, you'll see there's always like a um, dynamic equilibrium of prey going up and then predator, and it's always like continual, it's not like haphazardous. So I see the laws in nature, and I think God is scientific. Also, but then, okay, then how does that relate to me? How do I see things in a scientific and, I guess, religious or um, spiritual way? I think they answer two different questions. The science asks how, how does this happen? How does that work? But religion is why is this happening? And I think it's, both are important, but they address different parts of life, right? The physical and spiritual dimension. So um, I personally heard this um, example, and that helped me understand it, rather than just like learning this. And it's really basic, but why is the kettle boiling? If you've heard it before, don't answer. But if I said to you, why is the kettle boiling? What, was your, what would your intrinsic answer be to that? Huh? OK. Yeah. Is that most? I mean, as an English person, that's probably the most intrinsic answer, right? We're making a cup of tea. I'd say, huh? Yes. Oh, OK, good. Yeah, OK. You, See who's Lord, see, anyway, yes, to both answers. So basically the first one's the heat is causing the water to reach boiling temperature and it's boiling, right? 
I'd say that's more scientific answer of what's happening. But also, because we want tea, right? It's tea time. Um, you need both. But they don't work outside of each other. They work together. Because imagine you just view it scientifically. OK, I have a kettle. The water's boiling. So what's the point of the water boiling? What's the purpose of it? OK, it's just like seeing a statement, but then nothing happens after. So it's like there's no purpose of the kettle. But if you just say, I want tea, but you don't know how to make it, or if there, was no, if there was no scientific progress in humankind, we would never have learned how to make electricity, let alone a kettle. So it shows you need both. This is a really day-to-day -day example, but this made me realize it. Sorry, I touched the microphone, <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to end with two quotes based on this that I've heard. So science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts things together to see what they mean, by Jonathan Sachs. And science without religious is lame, and religion without science is blind. So yeah, I want to end there and just thank you for listening. Thanks. You spoke about um, the cat you're in. Okay. The parasite of the cat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, shall I just... So the, the reason that parasite exists is because for the cat's advantage, no. The parasite... Oh, no, the parasite just wants... It needs to... Um, I think the sexual cycle of a parasite development in the cat. So it's just doing it selfishly, basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It causes, actually, cysts in the cat. And I'm not sure if it causes disease, like, if it causes symptoms. But the cat doesn't want a parasite in its body, no. Parasites always negatively affect the host, so... But why is it... What's, is it just a side effect, then, that the mouse is attracted to the urine? No, because in, um, to complete its cycle, the parasite needs to be in the cat. Does that make sense? Like, the sexual development can only happen in the cat. It can't happen in the mouse. It's a bit complicated. Um, but the mouse is just like an intermediate. Um, so if it's only in the mouse, it can't develop fully. So it wants the mouse to be eaten by the cat because it knows that way it can get in the cat. Does that make sense? Its definite host is the cat, and it knows that a mouse can be eaten, if that makes sense. So it just wants a mouse to be nearer. Does that make sense? Uh, how does it know to make yeah, I know. I don't know. It's crazy. That's why this one's really interesting because it messes with the brain. And the brain is so hard to study. I mean, I don't study neurology, but I know it's really hard to just study the effects. But Maybe it was natural selection. Like, all the parasites that make them towards the urine. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. A lot of things are natural selection. But I'm trying to think if that... But well, then the mouse died. Anyway, I'm not sure. I don't want to say anything wrong in science. It's so stressful because if you say something wrong, it's like, now it's recorded. But anyway, I don't know. I'll check. But yeah. Uh, what's the, I think, Zika? That's what's the, I don't really know what I knew someone was going to ask about Zika. Okay. Um, I haven't researched. I know my, the professor in my lab is actually, because we study mosquito immunity, I know he's actually going to Brazil, I think, now to study Zika. All I know is that it's transmitted by a mosquito. But I think it's a different one. It's not the same as uh, malaria, because it's in Brazil and South America. And it causes birth defects. But at the moment, they're not sure if it causes any other symptoms in humans. But I'm not really sure where it came from, actually. Maybe it's a, I need to find out. Sorry. With, with exams, I, I, stu I struggle sometimes to read outside of. But I need to find out about that. But yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, That's like the one thing I can't wrap my head around because I study disease basically. Um, I spoke, the person that I spoke to about the lecture on science religion, he believes disease is natural, not like um, disease inside us, but disease caused by the organisms is natural because. If you kind of think in a very, I guess, logical way, you need populations to go up and down. You can't have populations growing forever. So he believes that disease is normal to keep populations. But some of these things are so horrible. So I don't really, I'm not sure what I feel about that. What do you think about it? Yeah. yeah. Like, which parasites? No. I mean, all parasites negatively affect the host. That's why it's called parasite. Okay. Yeah. Bacteria. Oh, bacteria, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, so why are some pathogenic? Yeah, I don't understand that either. That's why I'm, I don't really understand disease in that context. Um, I thought if humankind has a negative relationship with nature, that things in nature can kind of turn bad almost, but yeah, I'm not sure. Some people really don't agree with that, so I'm not really sure about that. So, yeah. But it's interesting. Did you say you found out how science and God relate? Yeah, oh, that's what I'm trying to, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm seeing how like, the spiritual side and physical side of understanding the world really, so yeah. Like logic and emotion, I don't know. Sorry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I need to find out more, I will, I will. This was just last week. If I hadn't gone to the lecture last week, I'd have nothing to say on that, honestly, because I really, before, I generally couldn't relate them at all, so yeah. Did you have a question, Tom? Okay. What's like the lifespan of a bacteria? Like, does it last a day or does it last forever? Quite, no, like a few hours. Yeah, they're really the smaller the organism, all the like the slower, or the faster it replicates. So they just multiply so quickly. Viruses are like sometimes a few minutes; they just multiply. And because they're not like us, where we have our individual lives, and they just because they're so small, they don't have as much of an identity. If that makes sense, they don't have sexes or anything, so they're just multiplying constantly. So it's quite hard to follow just one bacteria. But I don't think they last very long. So, yeah. What is it when, when you have food poisoning? What's the, the Most of the time it's E. coli and salmonella and shigella. Um, yeah, normally from raw poultry. Yeah. And your body just tries to, like, don't kill it. It just tries to, like, get it out of your body. Do you mean with, like, diarrhea and stuff? Um... Some, actually, diarrhea a lot of times is caused actually by, like, uh, there's a parasite called Giardia, which is it's quite, if I had a picture, I'll show it, it's quite pretty. But it, like, sticks on your intestinal wall. It doesn't actually, it's quite big, so it, it, it literally sucks on there. And it, like, sucks all the, um, is it, like, fats or something? And so you're, like, oh, this is quite graphic, I shouldn't say. So I know some people are a bit, like, it makes your stool, like, really greasy or something. So sometimes they have a direct effect on what happens. And with diarrhea, it's because water can't be absorbed by your intestines. So a lot of water, and that's why you get dehydrated and you have to constantly drink because your body can't absorb the water. So that's so the, to get rid of it. It, Diarrhea helps the bacteria, actually. Because the bacteria, they all want to spread to another person or another animal. They want to spread, and diarrhea helps spread. That's why in poor countries, when there's not good sanitation or like toilet, um, toiletries, it's really difficult because everything spreads so fast. So it's not good to have diarrhea. Throwing up, on the other hand, I think, I don't know. I think that's your body trying to get rid of it. But it's a different part of the digestive system, so, yeah. I think throwing up is not to do like, Yeah, I think it realizes something's wrong, and it, yeah. But, yeah. Diarrhea's not good for us. <laughs> so, yeah. Are there any viruses that are good for you? Oh, okay, there's something interesting. Okay, so as I said, viruses have to infect a cell, and so there's some that infect us, but there's actually some that infect bacteria, because bacteria actually are a lot bigger than viruses. So I don't think people realize bacteria can infect, I mean, viruses can infect bacteria, but some people think that should be a therapy. I think in a World War I or two, I'm not sure they use this, they, if people have a bacterial illness and they couldn't get rid of it with antibiotics, because antibiotics are a bit, there's a big, there's a big problem there, they use these viruses that only infect bacteria, and the bacteria die, but these viruses don't affect us, right? So apparently it worked, but then I don't know how, because obviously we have our own bacteria in our body as well, so I'm not sure that's probably why they haven't used it. But in that case, yeah, because they could help us potentially. And they're called phages, and a lot of people are trying to study to use them in medicine. But the ones that infect us, no, they normally cause disease in our body. But yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yes? What do you want to do in the future? Oh, I don't know, actually. I think I'm going to try a few things. I'm not sure if I can work. I like lab work, but when things go wrong, it's quite annoying. I think when, if you do, anyone's doing that lab project in Fano, you'll see what I mean. Um, so I'm not sure if I could be in a lab all day. But at the same time, I quite like science. So I don't know if I'll leave science. But actually, I'm not sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try different things when I finish. And I'll see what happens there. Um, 
be more specific. And then a lot of people drop out. It's quite, it's quite difficult. But, um, I mean, concerning education, it's quite hard. I'm going to admit, in my, it's probably a bit harder than other unis, because they expect a lot. But at the same time, I know that education is really good. Because, I mean, a lot of what stuff I'm learning is like literally research level. It's just researchers, researchers telling us what they're doing right now, rather than just learning. We do like hardly any textbook really like level stuff. We do a lot of just research. So I think in that case, it's really good if you want to learn more. But yeah, you're expected to put a lot more effort in. Fine. Now, I guess now I'm ending, I'm enjoying it. But in the beginning, it was a bit tough sometimes, if I'm honest. So yeah. But go for it if you want. It's a good union. Any more questions? Oh. Oh, yeah. With what? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Um, there's one thing. I don't know if did I. Okay, um. Well, I'll just go back. Okay, basically, you know, I mentioned smallpox is eradicated. That means it's no, it's no, no human has it. It's not anywhere. It's not anywhere in the natural world. But two labs still have it, and they're military labs. And I think Russia and the U.S. I don't know if the U.S. got rid of it, but I think Russia still has it. I hope this is not going anywhere. But yeah, um, pretty much Russia and military still have it. And the thing is, because the generation before us were vaccinated, but we're not. I don't think we're vaccinated anymore against smallpox. So if they were to use it, it'd be quite bad because it's re it spreads really fast. And I don't know if people have seen pictures, it's when you have loads of like pox and pustules over it, it's really painful. So some people are actually quite worried about that. So bioterrorism, yeah. But like, for bioterrorism, viruses are more of a problem because they're just faster and normally more aggressive than bacteria. And antibiotics only work against bacteria. With viruses, because they're not really alive, it's actually really hard to like, you can't really kill them. So that's why they're looking at bacteriophage. Um, yeah, that's where the phage as well. If they use it, it's a bit worrying because, like, I don't know if they can then change into attacking us. I'm not sure. I know viruses are quite, because they mutate a lot as well. So, in that sense, is that what you mean, like bioterrorism? Yeah. No. I'm looking more at how to cure disease. I'm being honest. I'm looking more at curing diseases. Um, no, because they do have a smallpox vaccine. So, yeah. Unless they make a virus, but I don't really know about that. So, don't worry. No point worrying about things like this a bit, but yeah. Is that, is that it? Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we have some few more events. So we've got one more carp talk. We have carp talks every week alongside with the share of your passion and carp talks. Um, yeah, basically pretty much like tech talks, but we organize them. Um, so there's one next week, the last one before exam period um, on Wednesday, and there's also a um, principal workshop where we go deeper into discovering, uh, you know, the laws of the universe and also how to match up with religion and that kind of stuff. So um, principal workshop, really great. I recommend it. This uh, happening between the 16th and the 17th. Um, please talk to uh, any of us if you want information. It's me. It's my books doing the filming and some others as well. Um, yeah, and that's sorry, that's the banner for the for the for the workshop and it's got some details like um, fee and who can contact and that kind of stuff and where it is and stuff. So yeah, thank you for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, please uh, talk some of yourselves, talk about the what we heard and uh, hope you have a nice evening everyone. So thank you. Thank you.